Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Law and Crime's Daily Debrief. No verdict today in the Harvey Weinstein sex crimes trial in Lower Manhattan. The jury deliberated about five hours, and right now, Gloria Allred, the accuser's attorney, attorney for several accusers, is speaking outside that courtroom. Let's listen live. To persuade another juror who may have initially started out with a different point of view. And sometimes everybody in the jury just wants to see it. But it's good that they're judging this case or trying to deliberate based on the evidence. I'm, I'm fine with that. We can't forecast what that means in reference to the ultimate result. So, I mean, everybody has a right to speculate, but just don't know what a jury's going to do in the end. They may not know whether they will reach a unanimous verdict in the end. And they may have more questions tomorrow. We don't know. But they'll be back at 930. Any other questions? It's very common for jurors to ask a lot of questions about the jury instructions because there's a great deal of legal, legalese in jury instructions because their job is to find the facts, but it's the court's job to instruct as to the law, and the law is sometimes not as exact and clear as jurors would like it to be, but it's not something that can be paraphrased by the court. They're just gonna have to do their very best to understand those jury instructions and follow them. And apparently that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to avoid a mistake and really clearly understand the jury instructions. You know, what does forcible compulsion mean? That type of thing. And now they're asking for evidence as opposed to the jury instructions to help them understand the facts since they are the finders of fact. So that's positive. I mean, I always think it's good to ask questions and try to get the answers. So that's, that's positive. Yet it doesn't tell us anything about whether there will be a verdict or not, or if so, when, and if so, what. Accuser attorney Gloria Allred speaking outside the Harvey Weinstein courtroom, where after about five hours of deliberation, there is no verdict after day one of deliberation. There was a spat in court this morning over an op-ed written over the weekend by lead Weinstein attorney, Donna Rattuno. The Newsweek op-ed by Donna Rattuno takes aim at the press, the justice system, and the jury. Every so often, a case comes along that dominates the headlines and pushes the limits of the system to a breaking point, Rattuno wrote. Jurors must accept the responsibility of not just considering the facts, testimony, and evidence, but cutting through the noise of a media and public intent on injecting their narratives into the courtroom. Judges instruct jurors to avoid all media coverage and outside influences in making their decision. But in a high-profile case like Harvey Weinstein's, does anyone think that's realistically possible? Rattuno then said, I implore the members of this jury to do what they know is right and was expected of them from the moment they were called upon to serve their civic duty in a court of law. She then said Weinstein was innocent. Prosecutor Jonah Luzzi complained to the judge that Rattuno was speaking directly to the jury through her writing and called the op-ed borderline jury tampering. Rattuno said she was commenting about criminal justice as a whole, not speaking to this jury. Defense attorney Damon Sharonis said the op-ed simply tracked what Rattuno said during closings. The judge told Rattuno not to speak to the press until there's a verdict. Attorney David Ring represents one of Weinstein's accusers. He joins me live from Los Angeles tonight. So, David, what's your reaction to Donna Rattuno's op-ed? Is it appropriate for her to say things, at least in the state's view, which were attempts to speak directly to the jury, which, of course, the jury is not supposed to be monitoring the press? Highly, highly inappropriate. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard of the lead defense lawyer in, in a huge high profile case, writing an opinion piece for a major magazine aimed directly at the jurors on her case. Highly inappropriate. 
The jury is asking apparently only about believing Annabella Shkora. That was one of the questions jurors asked this morning. What's your take on that? Well, look, I don't know if that's what they are asking. I think what the jury might have been trying to do is, is they look at Annabella Shore and say, OK, that's an easy one. We believe her. You know, we think she was raped, but why aren't there any charges attached solely to her? And so to cut through it all is really they have to find that Annabella Shore was raped, but also that either Mimi Halle and or Jessica Mann were sexually assaulted for there to be a conviction here. Exactly. Now, Weinstein has been charged but not arraigned there in Los Angeles because of the accusations of your client. Do you expect Los Angeles authorities to move against Weinstein quickly? And if so, how and maybe when? Well, my understanding is that once this New York trial is over, which hopefully will be soon, um, they will set an arraignment here in Los Angeles where, where Weinstein will have to come back to Los Angeles and appear in court here in L.A. to answer the charges. And then that sets the criminal case off. And it'll probably take a year or so for it to reach a trial here in Los Angeles. So many moving parts in this. David Ring, appreciate your insight on this case, of course, because you're directly involved. We'll have you at the end of the broadcast as well. Also today, a dispute over juror number 11. That juror is writing a book about predatory older men and more. Law and Crimes' Jesse Weber has been in the courtroom for us today and through much of the trial. He's live outside New York Supreme Court in Lower Manhattan tonight. Jesse. Hey, Aaron. Yeah, juror number 11 is somebody who the defense wanted kicked off at the beginning of jury instructions or, excuse me, jury uh, selection. As you talked about, she was penning this uh, controversial novel. Well, we just learned from the defense early this morning that this uh, juror actually uh, two weeks ago during the course of this trial posted a review on a book website reviewing a book about sexual assault of a young girl by an older man. Uh, the defense actually wanted her replaced with juror number one, an alternate. He is a older white gentleman. Uh, uh, this juror was brought in, questioned by the judge in a public forum. She first denied reviewing or reading any kinds of books and then admitted that she's currently reading a French book on this subject matter. After the judge excused her, the judge said, uh, look, she's reading it, really did nothing wrong. Uh, your motion is denied. And also that includes a motion for a mistrial. Not surprisingly, the defense asked it there. And uh, this trial uh, continued and the jury deliberations began. And Jesse, there were many questions by the jury. Of course, we talked about those a little bit just a couple of seconds ago. What can we read into those questions? It seems that this jury is taking these uh, this level of evidence very seriously. They are considering the issues, and they want to at least set up a, an understanding of what their options are with the charges. It's hard to get a sense of which way they're leaning, but they want to know what they could find Harvey Weinstein guilty of and what they cannot. It's a complicated verdict form. They want to have an understanding of it. And at this very point, given that they've deliberated for the entire day, they're taking their duties very seriously. Exactly. You know, the big question question there, can we convict as to or can we believe Annabella Shora? But then the big question mark is what comes after that? That was the big question today. Yeah, and it seemed that they wanted to know why they couldn't convict purely on Annabella Shore. I mean, why mention statute of limitations? I've been in that courtroom, Aaron, and I don't remember any side mentioning statute of limitations. It gives you pause to think about why are they considering this? They are probably wondering why is Annabella Shore not an independent charge? But as the judge said, that's just the case. He's not independently charged with Annabella Shore. They only can consider her in conjunction with Miriam Halle and Jessica Mann. That is the only way she factors into these charges and you have to know you have to be wondering what is the jury thinking and speculating at this point you know that's the fear jesse at least it would be my fear if i were either the prosecutor or the defense here because the jury has to be wondering wait a minute we heard from six accusers but the charges only directly relate to two of them that needs to be spelled out more clearly in my opinion maybe there's a legal bar for doing that in new york though yeah, and the judge made it very clear during his jury instructions. You heard from three women, Dawn Dunning, Tara Lee Wolf, Lauren Young. You are not to consider them as a form of propensity evidence that the defendant is more likely to commit these kinds of crimes. No, they are there to testify purely for the two issues about forcible compulsion and, of course, consent. That's the only way you're supposed to consider them. And that maybe was surprising to them about why did we hear about them, what was their understanding. And as soon as they went into that jury deliberation, 
deliberation room, they immediately came out with tons of questions. So maybe the jury, the judge's instructions weren't that clear. But as the judge said, if they have a question, he'll answer it. They can ask as many questions as they want, and he will read back as much as he needs to so that they have a full understanding of the law. Yeah, Jesse, it's a difficult process for juries in New York. Oftentimes, they're not given a lot back in the jury room, and that's the way it goes in this state. Jesse Weber live outside New York Supreme Court in Lower Manhattan tonight here on The Debrief. Two other attorneys are with us tonight to discuss this case. Ashley McMahon, I'll start with you here. What's your reaction to that op-ed that Donna Rotuno wrote and the fallout which resulted from it today? I'm interested in your disinterested take. Oh, wow. Well, I mean... Uh, if anybody should know better, this attorney should know better. I mean, this is lawyering 101. You know, people who have just passed the bar exam and are in their first trial know, hey, you don't make comments while the jury goes into deliberations or is about to go into deliberations about the guilt or innocence of your client to the media once you've already been admonished by the judge. Uh, you know, the media has been a big part of this case from day one. Uh, the defense team has never seemed to miss a beat on trying to say, hey, look, we think uh, media exposure is great for our client. Oh, except for when we want to change a venue. Uh, and that motion was denied. So I'm just absolutely shocked at the inappropriateness of this op-ed. Look, it's a big cat and mouse game. You've got the defense saying we have to say things publicly because the Me Too movement and Weinstein's accusers are very vocal. And it, it turns into a huge back and forth here. And at some point, the law needs to just draw a line and say enough's enough. Dean Adal, though, Weinstein's PR strategy here for the court of public opinion seems to be this. Let's complain about the trial being flawed so that if there is a guilty verdict, then we've planted the seed that people should not trust the verdict. That, that sort of sums it up. Is that wise or is, is that ludicrous? Well, I think what you're alluding to is the reality that he does, he is being faced with charges in two courts, really. Yes, one is a criminal court. And the other one is a court of public opinion. I mean, he has said many times he wants to be able to go back out and work again. If he were acquitted in a criminal case, he still feels like he needs to be acquitted in public. And that was why he gave an uh, interview right as the trial started. That's why his lawyer is going out there. He matters. He cares just as much about what the public thinks as, as those 12 jurors. Many opinions on this case. The jury resumes for deliberations tomorrow. And still ahead tonight here, the penalty phase of a death penalty trial involving a convicted Ohio killer who lived a life as a career criminal and a defendant's reaction to learning authorities linked his discarded DNA to a 1979 cold case. We're back right after this. Welcome back, everybody. The penalty phase of a murder trial involving a career criminal is happening right now in Ohio. A jury there convicted Anthony Pardon of murdering Rachel Anderson on her 24th birthday. The state presented DNA, phone records, and video of the defendant's acquaintances using the victim's debit card. The jury convicted Pardon of four aggravated charges, robbery, kidnapping, rape, and burglary. The state says the jury should recommend the death penalty for those four circumstances and a fifth. On May uh, 11th of 1982, and was convicted of attempted murder. And you'll see down here uh, also uh, in that same case, convicted of aggravated robbery. He was also convicted of rape. Uh, he was sentenced by this judgment entry by Judge Paul Martin of this court to 5 to 25 at the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections. That is by statute a aggravating circumstance that joins on that scale of four others and which the state submits will carry our burden of proof of uh, those five aggravating circumstances beyond a reasonable doubt. And ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing you will hear in this courtroom on the defendant's history, background, or circumstances that mitigate this 55-year-old man for what he did on January 20. 8th of 2018 in terms of the punishment to him. Pardon's defense told the jury to pay attention to the mitigating factors. His elementary school teacher says things could have been different. His family will talk about his childhood and a doctor will describe what it was like for Pardon to go to prison at age 16. 16 year old Anthony Pardon going into an adult prison 
at 16. And not just any adult prison, the worst prison in Ohio, Lucasville. And he's going to tell you that that 16-year-old stayed in prison until he was 41 years old. And then you're going to hear that that 41-year-old came out of prison. No programs, no guidance, nothing. And that that 41-year-old was out of prison for less than a year and goes back in prison and stays from the age of approximately 42 until he was 52. From an abused, dysfunctional, chaotic childhood went from that dysfunction at 16 and spent the rest of his life in prison. The jury has to decide whether it's life in prison or the death penalty for that defendant. There is no death penalty in Iowa where a 66-year-old man is accused of committing a cold case murder. Prosecutors in Cedar Rapids say Jerry Burns killed then 18-year-old Michelle Martinko back in 1979 when Burns was 25. The 40-year-old cold case languished until DNA tests were invented and public genealogy databases became weapons for law enforcement. Authorities say Michelle Martinko suffered 29 wounds, 11 of them stab wounds. Prosecutors say the killer left behind blood on the gear shift of the car where Martinko's body was found. Plus, testimony revealed that a partial male DNA profile was recovered in 2005 from a blood stain on the back of Martinko's dress. Investigators today played the interview where they approached the defendant and began asking him about Michelle Martinko's murder. These are his initial reactions with his pet cat getting in the way of the undercover video. We work in the cold case unit mm -hmm. down at Cedar Rapids Police Department and uh, we're following up on an old case. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've heard it in the news at all. It's a homicide that happened at Westdale Mall. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Martinko, is that something you've ever heard of? Yeah. Okay. Did you see it in the paper or anything like that? No. How, long time ago. Long time ago. What we've been doing lately is we've been following up on leads. Mm -hmm. And we got, uh, we had an article run in the paper the other day. And so we just got a bunch of new leads and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. People calling in, giving us tips and whatnot. And so we've been stopping by and just chatting with people and, and, and trying to kind of determine, you know, which leads are good and which leads are not and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Well, long story short, your name came up. Hey. Hmm. Strange. Yeah. Well, it's not that uncommon. I mean, people call in all the time. Mm -hmm. Had you ever um, heard of Michelle Martinko before that mm -hmm. this case came out? Um, okay. Had you ever seen her picture in the paper or anything like that? long time ago. So in 79, did you ever have a reason to be in Cedar Rapids or anything like that? Not really. So. Did you go to Westdale Mall? Oh yeah, we've gone to Westdale Mall. Sure. Now, this defendant became very curious about composite sketches, which were developed by a DNA lab using the profile on the dress and the gear shift. Eventually, the conversation turned to what authorities call the DNA match between the defendant's discarded DNA a sample taken during the interview, and blood left behind at the crime scene. We kind of know going in that this is probably going to be a match. Oh, really? Yeah. Why would that be? Well, we are kind of hoping you'd tell us. The reality is we're not, we're not here on a whim. Hmm. I'm telling you, Jerry, I already know that your DNA is going to match the, the DNA hmm. that we have on file. Just one there, I got rid of it. Well, you, people get rid of stuff all the time and uh, just throw it away. We have your DNA at the crime scene, and so we know you were there that night this happened. Uh, but what we don't know, Jerry, is why it happened. I don't know what that explanation would be if I don't hear it from you. Well, I don't know. H how would we get your DNA at the crime scene there, Jerry? I don't know. Test it, see if it is. No, 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 we did. Hmm. How would it be there, Jerry? I don't okay. know. What happened that night? Wait for the test to come back. Jerry, we... I don't think it did. It did? I don't uh, think so. Okay. Jerry, what happened that night? I don't know. Test it and see what happens. Yeah, I don't... We're going to test this. Okay. okay. Go ahead and test it. We are. But what I'm telling you is I'd already collected some DNA from stuff you discarded, and it matched our sample. 
All right, let's head to our panel one final time tonight. Ashley McMahon, how do you read this interview with the police? If this guy really did this, he was basically rehearsing that for about 40 years. Or he could be thinking, hey, look, it's been 40 years. I've gotten away with it at this point. He's a bit more casual than maybe somebody that you bring in for an interrogation within days or hours of a crime occurring. Again, it's always difficult to gauge uh, people's reactions to this kind of information because everybody is different. What I found unusual about his testimony though, was that, or his interview is the fact that he said, you know, like, well, let's test it and see, let's test it and see. He didn't out, outright come, come out and say, no, I didn't murder this person or you have the wrong guy, just let's, let's test it and see. Almost like a challenge to police officers. David Ring, how did you view that, that interview? If I'm sitting across from a police officer who's accusing me of murder and I didn't do it, I'm saying, what are you talking about? I, I wasn't there. I didn't do it. You got the wrong guy. This guy sits there and goes, oh, okay, what do you got? Yeah, go ahead and test it. I don't know. Pretty compelling evidence for the prosecution right there. So you're thinking that this points towards a guilty conscience that has been rehearsed, that he was waiting for this day that authorities would show up uh, basically in his office uh, with his cat to uh, basically bring this information to his attention. Dina Dahl, does the cat add sympathy to this? I mean, it's just the, the most bizarre quirk. The most bizarre, and yes, I do think it adds sympathy. He's caring for a living thing. Here is this cold murderer, and he's petting his cat while he's being accused of murder. If anything, it's distracting to the jury. It's distracting to the fact that he is showing very little emotion which, although I don't think that should really show somebody is guilty, we see over and over here on the network when somebody shows very little emotion when they are accused of murdering somebody, the jury doesn't like it. You know, Dina, how do you take this uh, conversation that he had where he basically was like, well, you know, I don't think the composites really look like me. If it did, I would have been a much more handsome guy when I was younger. It, but, but he's very curious about the pictures and he's very curious about the tests. Yeah, it's almost as if he, I mean, look, it has been 40 years. He's probably shocked. Like, how on earth have, if he did it, he's like, how on earth have they found me after 40 years? And if he didn't, it's probably just very puzzling. This is a very old case, and suddenly it seems like the police has a ton of information mm -hmm. on him. Precisely. He's trying to figure out why. Yeah, okay. Well, the bottom line here is that he says he didn't do it. He's raising questions about contamination and whatnot. Thanks a lot to the panel. We're out of time on the debrief. We'll see you back here tomorrow night at 5.